Hi everyone, this is Robert and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Today we are continuing our run through of Targaryen rulers and we have reached King Viserys the First, this guy here. Viserys the Second comes a few years after the Dance of the Dragons. Viserys the Third is the Viserys we know in um, Game of Thrones, that's uh, Daenerys's brother, but this is Viserys the First, ably played, of course, by Paddy Considine in House of the Dragon. We're going to try and dig into his character a little bit. They did change a few things from uh, book to show, and his is the character that George R. R. Martin drew out as saying this was the one that I thought worked best, or at least he was saying that this is the character that he felt added to what he had written. He felt that the writing, that Paddy Constantine's acting, added another layer to what he had already um, put down there on the page, making it more nuanced. I would agree. I thought it was a fantastic performance. Um, what we'll do, though, is I will try, as always, to frame this around questions I have from my patrons. I'll try and pick up as many questions as I can in the chat. For those who were looking out for me last week, uh, yes, I did indeed have a lovely uh, week off, just went off and Spent some time with some friends, travelled a little bit, saw some castles, which I'm very excited by. Always, um, I'll probably, when I get a moment, put a few pictures up in Instagram, Twitter, places like that, if you are interested in that kind of thing. But let's get into this character. So, who, <coughs> pardon me, who was Viserys, um, and what do we know? I'm not going to labour the, um, uh, the sort of the intro here because I think we've seen House of the Dragon, so a lot of his time we do know about. But it's probably just worth giving a little bit of his backstory. He was born in the year 77 AC, and he is the grandson of Jaehaerys I, the old king, the great king of, uh, of the Targaryen rule, who um, really was the person who stabilised the, the Seven Kingdoms. He was the person who established the Seven Kingdoms after all of the tumult of the previous three kings' reigns. He was the person who had stabilised everything. But you know, he had 13 children with Alison, but it had a problem with a lot of them kept on dying. And as we talked about in the last few weeks of this, we, this led to a, a, a series of questions about who was going to inherit after Jaehaerys. Now, eventually this came down to um, Balon, who was the father of Viserys and Daemon, who we obviously also know from House of the Dragon. He was made the heir, um, and in, I think it was 92 um, AC, so when uh, Viserys was 15 years old, he had he spent his childhood not being in the line of succession, but then at the age of 15 he was. He grew up for the next 10 years or so before his father died unexpectedly, um, there we will come into the causes of that a little bit later, but his father died unexpectedly. That was what led to, that was the crisis that led to the um, Great Council of 101. The Great Council of 101 is what we saw at the beginning of House of the Dragon. This was the, um, the, the council that decided that Viserys should be king rather than Laenor. Now, on the show, they conflated things a little bit, uh, understandable. Um, they made it between him and Rhaenys. But when we got to that uh, council in the books, this was between Viserys and Laenor himself. The vote, we're told, was overwhelming. 95, more than 95% of people voted for Viserys. Viserys gets made heir. Within two years, Jaehaerys is dead. So he then takes over and um, he reigns. He reigns uh, for around about a quarter of a century. And he is generally seen as a good human. He's, he seems to be a nice man, amiable. He seems to have been generous. He seems to have been a conflict avoider. But um, people seem to still like him. The time that he ruled was broadly a peaceful time. It was a time when the coffers of the nation were spilling over with gold. Everything was going well. He was married. He'd been married by this point. By the time he um, 
actually acceded to the throne. He'd been married to Emma Arryn, his wife, for 10 years already by this point, actually. He married quite young when he was 16. He ascended when he was 26. They had lost one son already, uh, tragically in childbirth, but then also had one daughter, Rhaenyra. Rhaenyra was known as the realm's delight. Everybody loved Rhaenyra. He didn't name her his heir straight away, um, but she was his only child. The, the assumption always was he's still a young man, Emma's still a young woman, there will be more children coming along. Obviously, events took over. She died. And then there was this great falling out with Damon, because Damon had always assumed he's the next in line. He's the oldest uh, male uh, in the line of succession, therefore he thought he would be ahead of Rhaenyra in the line of succession. You can understand why he might think that, because of course Viserys himself came to power because of this decision that the, uh, the the rulership should only pass down through the male line, not the female line. And so, of course, Damon thinks that he's next in line. But it seems as if they didn't ever actually have that conversation, because there was a little bit of a misunderstanding between them. And we get that air for a day jibe when um, Emma Aaron dies, uh, and their son also dies and uh, a day later and Damon apparently while drunk makes this joke about him her being the heir for a day now on the show they seem to sort of soften this they didn't actually show us exactly how he said it but the implication was maybe this was him being mean maybe it was actually him just raising a toast to uh, his dead nephew we're not shown. In the book, it seems a lot clearer. Certainly in the way it's reported, it seems a lot clearer that Damon was indeed mocking his uh, his dead nephew and being grateful that he was still the heir. This led to a falling out. Not only was Damon banished, but also Viserys decided, well, I, I need to be clear about who is my heir. If there's some kind of uncertainty going on, I need to be clear. He said, Rhaenyra is my heir. And that is a decision he never backed down from all the way through the rest of his reign. Now, obviously, he then came under pressure to remarry. He eventually did to Alicent. He had more children, but he never backed down from this idea of Rhaenyra being his heir. The two factions of the Greens and the Blacks start to emerge because we get two possible uh, heirs. Obviously, we've got Rhaenyra, the named heir, but then the oldest son, Aegon. The two camps start to clash. Viserys does prevent war during his lifetime. It's quite a low bar, but he does achieve that. But he seems to do that as much by the fact that everybody loves him and he just like says... You know, come together, shake hands, smile at each other, and it will be okay. And so they do, they play along, but everybody knew. You can tell this growing feeling that there has to be a point when Viserys dies for all of this to be out in the open. He, on, on the show, his, his sickness, his illness seems to come from these cuts that he seems to be uh, getting, and the although they don't ever truly say exactly what it is, there does seem to be something that looks a bit like leprosy or something like that going on with him. I'm not entirely sure what's going on there, but in the books, it's just it, the, the impression we get is just that he gets very portly, very overweight, overweight unfit. Um, he does get infections from a cut. He has to have two fingers cut off at one point. Um, but eventually he dies at a relatively young age. And people did see it coming. Um, but even so, it obviously the exact timing was a bit of a surprise. So, Viserys, what can we sort of summarise for his reign? This was despite the fact that we look at Viserys and think he was a he was a weak leader, he was a weak king. When you read Fire and Blood, it's very clear this was, most people see, the high point 
of the Targaryen rule, all the way if you take the entirety of the the Targaryen rule from Aegon the the first through to um, uh, the Mad King right at the end, this was the high point in terms of the power of the Targaryens, the number of dragons that were around, the number of Targaryens that were around, the the empire itself, the the continent being at peace the the riches for prosperity it was all there so his was indeed a weak rule but it was also a strong rule so that's the sort of the introduction and, and summary um let's have a quick flick through uh the chat um uh sure i've got a couple of questions coming on here um uh, Andrew Cage is saying it's criminal uh, that Paddy was not nominated for Golden Globes in Lesson Mistake. No, as far as I'm aware, Paddy uh, Considine was not nominated for anything, um, which is a shame for this, certainly. Um, I mean, I think that's... It, it, for me, it was the best performance by a single person in all of Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon. Um I do have a conspiracy theory as to why not, which is simply that his the standout bit of his performance was in episode eight of the season. And I suspect that a lot of the critics and people who vote in these kinds of things tend to uh, they tend to get set sent to the first few episodes of a season. And if they really love it, then I might carry on watching it. But if they, you know, they've got busy jobs, they need to watch a lot of other things. Sometimes they just watch the beginning half of some seasons. And Paddy was excellent all the way through, but it was only really in episode eight that for me it went up to sort of stratospheric levels. But anyway, I personally don't pay huge amounts of attention to all of these uh, different awards shows, uh, but I do feel a bit sad for him that what I thought was one of the finest performances of his career was not uh, recognised. Um, Marvin Martin saying, could uh, Viserys's bad attitude towards dragons be in part due to the maesters and Hightower allies whispering in his ear? Um, interesting question. So one of the things which will come up a lot in this, I suspect, is the, the changes between book and show. Not that there were huge changes, and I should probably emphasize that at the beginning, because I will probably pick out quite a few changes, but um, the changes that were there were a matter of emphasis as much as anything else, sometimes extra little details coming in on the show. Now, we don't get much detail about Viserys' relationship with dragons from the book. We get told that he rode Beleriand when he was younger, then Beleriand died, and he never rode another dragon. He never attempted to ride another dragon. We could probably draw some conclusions from that. But we know that pretty much all of his children rode dragons. Uh, his brother rode dragons, uh, rode a dragon. Uh, his wider family rode, rode dragons. It's not that he ever tried to stop anyone from riding dragons, as far as we can tell. It's just that he made a personal decision not to ride another dragon. So I think we can probably say that he, whatever happened with him and Balerion, we'll dig into that in a moment, but whatever happened with him and Balerion made him not particularly want to personally be riding another dragon. Could the fact that the, the high towers and the maesters be whispering in his ear be a part of that? Possibly, uh, but that's, I think, a bit later. The, the fact is that he is the only example we have within the canon of somebody outlasting their dragon by any significant amount of time. So we simply do not know if this is normal. Is it is it normal for somebody, when if their dragon dies of old age, for them to just say, you know what, that's it. I'm not going to be riding another dragon. Is that normal or was that different for Viserys. That's the key uh, point. The The show added on a few extra nuances. It added in a line when he was talking about a throwaway line about, you know, dragons are just too powerful, we should never have dabbled in, in on all of that. Uh, that is a shocking line <laughs> coming from a Targaryen king, particularly coming from somebody who rode Beleriand. Um, why? Again, I will dig into that in a moment. But um, my general take is that, first of all, we don't know. 
the, all of the details. We haven't been told all the details, uh, so we can only speculate. But secondly, I, it's not that he was anti-dragon from birth. He could have chosen pretty much any there were plenty of dragon eggs if he'd wanted to sort of hang around and wait for a dragon egg he went for the biggest dragon there was so he wasn't anti-dragon to start with but uh, and he wasn't anti-dragon later he tolerated other people with their dragons it's just that he decided based on his personal experience no no more um Have a quick flick through Mara Lee. Oh, hi there, Mara. Great to see you. Saying just a show of love and appreciation for all the fabulous content and merch and have been enjoying the great stories on the Well Tell Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Um, you have a wonderful voice. You're the best. Much love to you and Dan, your handsome dog. Yes, yeah, so he's taking himself up to bed. Dan, as he often does. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, he's uh, he's been having a nice run around today. And also, Mara Lee saying, for all the fellow mods, you guys rock. Absolutely agree. Let's get a bit of mod love in early on in this stream. If you are watching this live, um, the the chat is a safe place because the moderator's there making sure that there's no spamming, there's no um, intolerance or anything. This is something I find uh, I, I take very seriously, is that I hugely encourage active debate, disagree with me, disagree with other people, but everybody has to be treated with respect. So the moderators do that and they do a fantastic job. So if you are in the chat, please do uh, show them a little bit of love. Um, uh, Brothers Crin saying, uh, sadly, you got to go now. Hi there, Brothers Crin. Uh, I had my own live stream to attend on another channel. Uh, well, best of luck with that. Uh, Brothers Crin have uh, an excellent channel um, covering mostly Tolkien stuff. Um, and just looking through, have I got any more questions here? Lots of mod love. Uh, okay, let's get into um, some questions um, from my uh, patrons. Uh, first of all, uh, Diego Godoy saying, um, Hola, Robert. Hola. Um, Viserys I was chosen as heir to the Iron Throne partly because Rhaenys was skipped on the line of succession due to her gender. Afterwards, Viserys names Rhaenyra as his heir over Aegon II. Does Viserys ever show any signs of realising the irony of this whole situation? Um, and... Uh, 444 similar questions saying I've never fully understand understood about Viserys why he chose his daughter to be his heir um, when he was chosen to be king by ignoring the female pardon me the female heir of his uncle um, in a similar situation his grandfather Jaehaerys ignored female heirs and promoted male heirs um, to not raise any question about his own legitimization what is your view do you think there was any bad blood between Rhaenys and Viserys or do they respect each other despite what happened well on the the last point um we don't get any real indication of any bad blood between uh, Viserys and Rhaenys we kind of get the impression in the book that uh, they've both accepted the situation, and Rhaenys, if she still has aspirations to power, wishes that through her children rather than herself, for herself. So not not her ambition seems not to be there. I loved what they did on the show when you got that scene, I don't know where it was, episode five, six, something like that, when you get Viserys goes to visit Corlys, and then Rhaenys suddenly comes in, realises that he's there, she throws open her arms, runs to him, cousin, she's calling out. There, there's a bond that's there and she as a character on the show I thought he best did a fantastic job of showing somebody who has um, managed to grow to a position of acceptance of what happened to her without losing that um, very pragmatic understanding of why it happened and and that I think is is something that was really quite well played they could have made her character there be quite embittered uh saying why is it that the men always inherit it's just a disgrace she doesn't she 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 accepts what happened without ever accepting that it was right uh, which i think we made her a lot more of an interesting character but um let's dig into this idea about why 
he or how he could justify this to himself. So to start with the Jaehaerys point. So Jaehaerys, Viserys's predecessor, his grandfather, had he he decided who was going to inherit, and twice, um, both times, this led to uh, the the. Uh, the quarrels they were called the first and second quarrels with his wife Alison. Twice he decided we'll go with uh, the male candidate rather than the female candidate, even though the female candidate was closer in the line of succession. Now that meant that Viserys, a lot of his own legitimacy came from the fact that he was chosen because of the fact that he came through the male line. His, from his father, rather than Lenore, say, who came through his mother. So you could certainly see straight away that there is a little bit of a conflict there with naming Rhaenyra, his daughter, as heir, and then keeping her as heir afterwards. But I think we have to understand the situation that was facing Viserys at the time. Viserys, for a long time, did not name an heir. This much is clear. For the first um, uh, few years of his uh, his reign, uh, while Rhaenyra was quite young, he did not name an heir, which is how Damon thought that he was the heir, because there was there was no official confirmation of this. When Damon and Viserys have their argument, Damon gets vanquished. Viserys very clearly has decided, I don't want Damon to be next in line. So Damon is out of the picture. Who else is left? He decides he does need to have an heir. He, he does need to name an heir, or otherwise something similar could happen again. But who is who is left to him? Well, he's got Rhaenyra, his daughter, and the other, other Targaryens. Who, who else is there really around? Well, there's Rhaenys, and then there's Rhaenys's children. And if he, if he named them, any of them heir, uh, that would be far more of a, an admission that he should never have been king than him naming Rhaenyra. You could come up with, if you, if you kind of like stretched the logic a lot, uh, if you say uh, that the rule for who should be um, next in line is it should only pass through the male line. However, if the that's not possible because there are no other people in the male line or they they have been thrown out of the the line of succession then you have to go with the eldest child of the king you could come up with a rule like that which is implicitly what he did but all of this boils down to the fact that he was the king and he was allowed to do whatever air he wanted. Did people query it? Well, yes. But did they query his right to name who he wanted as heir? No. That never, never really happened. We've got, we get, even when we get uh, the High Towers pushing Aegon's claims, they're not pushing uh, Viserys to, um, they're not pushing the point that Viserys is not allowed to choose who's the heir. They think that he should be allowed to choose who's heir. However, uh, it's he's clearly got it wrong. <laughs> so that's the line that they're pushing. Um, so he is allowed to choose who he wants. Does he see any um, contradiction in here? I mean, he was a clever guy. He probably did realise this, but I don't think he had really that many other options. Um, let's have a... Um, quick flick through. Uh, Pierre Davis saying, I can't wait for Fire and Blood Part 2, uh, Blood and Fire. Yeah, so this, um, well, I'll read the rest of this. To read some more info on Viserys the Second, he's in my top four kings based off of things uh, I've read. Yeah, Viserys the Second is a fascinating character. Um, we'll get onto him in a few weeks' time. And I definitely want to read more about him. Um, as for, I give these kind of updates every now and then. Um, as for Fire and Blood Part Two, George R. Martin clearly wants to write it. He's been very clear that he, any list of priorities that he's given us in the past, we should 
not think about too much because um, everything is a priority for him, he has said. Um, that means that uh, if he stays healthy and well and all is good, then I think we can expect to see Fire and Blood Part 2 some point. Um, he has said it will probably be called Blood and Fire. The implication is that it was going to go all the way through from um, where we start at the end of the Regency all the way up to Robert's Rebellion. That seems quite ambitious to me. Maybe he'll want to take it up to, I don't know, the, uh, the Blackfire Rebellions and then do Fire and Blood Part 3. I don't know. Um, but if I had to guess at the moment, his probable writing order is finishing off The Winds of Winter. We've not had an update on that for a while, but yes, he is still writing it 75% uh, of the way through last time he told us. Um, I imagine he'll probably want to finish off another Duncan Egg because it was halfway through uh, one when he left off. After that, perhaps we'll get Fire and Blood Part 2. Um, then, fingers crossed, we might get a Dream of Spring, but I'll be happy for anything from him at the moment. Um, uh, I think let's go to um, Andrew Kay saying uh, Viserys is... Uh, his reign was quite complicated. It was one of the most peaceful and prosperous for nearly three decades, but ultimately defined by his disastrous succession dealings. Yeah, it's this is one of those things where you, you have to kind of look at it and go, he does seem to have, I mean, a good person, undoubtedly a good person as far as we can tell, albeit a conflict avoider. And the reign was good, albeit he didn't have the challenges that, you know, the faith uprisings and things like that that others had um and he did survive all the way through to to the end with everybody liking him and the emperor and the the seven kingdoms intact but the day he died everything erupted in warfare so um, yeah swings and roundabouts some good things some less good things travis um saying hey robert hey uh, my question is about the council, uh, the Great Council of 101, choosing Viserys as king. You mentioned that you think there was some shenanigans regarding the voting likely uh, by the maesters. I tend to agree. Getting 95% of people to agree on anything is impossible. My question is in regards to motive. How does Viserys, rather than Rhaenys on the throne, further the cause? What is their cause? From what I understand, the maesters are trying to purge magic from the world, but I don't see how this accomplishes that goal. Okay, interesting question. So uh, for those who've missed my earlier conspiracies on this, the, the, the Great Council of 101, this is the one we saw at the beginning of House of the Dragon, the maesters were in charge of this. Who is going to inherit? Now, I, 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 I'm not saying there was some kind of uh, conspiracy or shenanigans going on, but it looks quite suspicious. Uh, as you say, 90, we're told that over 95% of people voted for Viserys and yet we're also told a reasonably long list of really quite important and powerful houses like the Baratheons, like the Starks, um, like the Velaryons, like I don't know the um, uh, Mandalays who also who voted the other way and it just doesn't quite doesn't quite add up. Um, the Maesters did all the vote counting. They didn't say who voted for who. Um, they didn't say what the final score was. Um, they just allowed the rumour to come out that this was over 95%. So it all sounds a little bit suspicious. But the question is, why? Why, why might they? Y yes, they might have had opportunity. They definitely had opportunity. Um, but did they have, and means, but did they have a motivation? If we buy into this idea that the Maesters, and I, I think we should, but if we buy into this idea that the Maesters are trying to build a world that is has, is not reliant on magic, the Maesters will have, on a kind of a meta level, they will have suddenly got really concerned by what was going on in Westeros, because Westeros was slowly going that direction. Then the dragons arrived, three dragons. Three dragons have started to expand out. It's now no longer just three Targaryens. We've got 
plenty of uh, target, but future Targaryens, lots of dragon eggs, the potential for lots of dragons. Who th There are two possible candidates. Candidate number one, we have Lenor Velaryon. Lenor Velaryon, by name of Velaryon, but he is a dragon rider. His sister's a dragon rider. His mother was a dragon rider. Um, they are basically Targaryens. There's every reason to think he loves riding his dragon. There's every reason to think his children would also be dragon riders. This is very good and positive for the dragon side. Or you could pick this other guy, Viserys, who had been riding a dragon, but the dragon died, and then he seems to have not wanted to ride another dragon again. He married somebody who wasn't a Targaryen. She did have a little bit of Targaryen blood in her, but she wasn't a Targaryen. He didn't seem to be very pro-dragon at all. Out of those two candidates, which would the maesters be most likely to want to be on the throne? I would argue Viserys. Maybe it doesn't seem like a, you know, a hugely an overwhelming thing one way or the other. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was just the maesters just thought, you know, what well, we do have a chance here to, to say nobody will ever know who do we want on the throne out of the two. Let's go for that guy who doesn't want to ride another dragon. Um, so I think that that's, that that's the motive. That's that's all we have. It's not a massive one, but that it's to say it's very suspicious. Um, uh, Mark Shisa saying, "Don't forget, Viserys was friends with Otto, who was ambitious, and High Towers, who are, um, uh, of course, chummy with the Maesters." Um, Sorek, how did Valerian die? Was it just old age? Yeah, that's pretty much all we're told, o old age. Um, maybe there was something else there, but uh, basically, as as far as we can tell, we don't get much by way of dragons getting old again, so we don't have a huge amounts of evidence, but when it comes to Valerian and, and also Vagar to an extent, as they get older, Yes, they get fiercer. Yes, their uh, scales get harder. Yes, their fire gets uh, hotter, but also they get a bit sleepier. They get a little bit uh, lazier, lie around a lot, and eventually it seems they just die of old age. So we're not told, but that's certainly the implication. Um uh, Dagon Thranos saying, why didn't Viserys take an Asozi Valyrian descended woman as his wife, having no available female Targaryens? Well, so uh, Emma Arryn did have um, Targaryen, uh, Targaryen in her heritage, so it wasn't like completely out of the blue. Um, reflective rambling, picking up a question. Thank you very much. I love it when people do this. Picking up a question for Voltaire the Gold Flame. I wonder if the leprosy like disease Viserys gets is related to the other rider of Valerium who dies of a horrible disease. So, this will, I assume you're referring to Arian, um, oh, sorry, Aria, Aria, uh, Targaryen, who this was back in the reign of Jaehaerys. She was still young and adventurous. Uh, and climbed onto the back of Valerian. Valerian flew off, we think, to, to Valeria. I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. She comes back. It's one of the most horror moments in Fire and Blood. She's infested with um, some kind of fireworms. Horrible. Um, is that related to uh, what vice happens to it? Viserys seems to be very different as far as I can see. What happens there is she seems to have got something happened to her while she was wherever Valerian took her, probably um, old Valeria. They seem to have managed, they um, being the Archmaester and um, Septon Bath, seem to have managed to kill off whatever those horrible fireworm things are by an ice bath, basically. Um, that that seems to have been dealt with it they they deal with the body that seems to have all been dealt with so hint that that is what happened with Viserys um 
certainly what happened with area if it were the same thing that happened to area in the matter of about a year at most um if they somehow that had got transferred onto Balerion and then that got transferred from Balerion onto uh, Viserys he had a good 25 30 years or so after that to uh to get that and we don't get any uh, hint that it's the same thing so um it's a nice idea but I don't think that's uh, what it was um ak channel tv good to see you robert good to see you too is there anything viserys could have done to prevent the dance or was war inevitable shout out to the great mods and chat um could he have done anything we will come back to this a lot i think but yes he could have done um some ways more dramatic than others um, but i think that um, the easiest way for us this to uh, have not happened would be to sort of pick a side. He did pick a side, he picked Rhaenyra, but he never really clamped down on the others. He was just like, whenever there was a conflict, he said, right, everyone get together, tell each other you love each other, and let's move on. But he didn't just say the next time... And anything like this happens, and stick to him. He, sometimes he, he came out with a, the next time somebody says something, then I'll have their tongue out. But um, he, he rarely kind of enforced this. He he willfully looked the other way. There were rumours, there were mutterings, and he was just happily looking in the other direction. So he could have been a lot stronger. Ultimately, I am of the view that... The Targaryens have a succession crisis every generation. It's just a thing they do. Um, so, that yeah, he could have done more to prevent this. But I, th I think there would have been a clash of Targaryens regardless. I, I don't think that there... If it wasn't that issue, then it would have been some something else. So he, he prevented there being one while he was alive. After he died... Um, if it wasn't that, it was going to be something else. Um, Andrew Kay talking about the council, great council, saying it also seems that the council voted for who Jaehaerys ultimately wanted also. Um, he resisted fam female heirs and surely wanted to keep the Targaryens as the ruling family line. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. Um, watch this cow fly, a uh, retracted message. I uh, assume that was from the moderator's um, uh, Reflect of being picking up on that question about whether the, there's a link between what happened with Aria and, and what happened to um, uh, Viserys. Is it possible that what happened to her did not kill Balerion, but infested him and adapted and mutated into a new contagion? Yeah, I mean, I, I do like this, th this thinking, but it's they, they strike me as different things. What happened with area targaryen was and excuse if you're about to eat some food or something because it's not it's not very pretty but these were like literally fireworms underneath her skin moving around um some of them were massive the size of a forearm that is horrific that's not what we read about in the book with viserys changed the way that it looked for the tv show to make it look more dramatic or in the um in the book it's basically uh yes he he had an infected finger from a cut um the maester cut the fingers off and that seems to have sorted that um but it seems more like gout or something like that to be honest rather than anything else with viserys so it seems to be uh, a different thing Jennifer Mullen uh, saying, thank you so much for providing so much knowledge and entertainment. I just finished your Traveller's Guide to Westeros and fell in love with your content through that series. Oh, that makes me so happy. Yeah, the Traveller's Guide uh, series of videos I did ages ago, years ago, actually, um, which, um, yeah, I really enjoyed making. I'm, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you enjoyed them as well. Uh, Go Daniel 10, do you think the difference in Viserys' personality between the books and the TV show have effects on the story further down the line? Um, differences in his personality. Um, 
I'm not sure that with his personality they do. The the big thing there was, and I should have, uh, if I thought about it, I could have brought it up. Uh, Paddy Considine um, did a really um, fascinating, actually quite moving Instagram post after that episode um, where he was just sort of thanking everybody for their kind words and then said where his inspiration came for playing Viserys and his understanding of the character. And he said it really clicked when um, the the actress playing Emma Aaron, whose name I forget, but she's excellent, a really good actress. Um, and when the two of them worked together and that character died, he realised for him that Viserys died as well in his heart because he loved her so much. And so everything that happens afterwards, this is what he says, his interpretation of that character, everything that happens afterwards, he's just accepting it as sort of penance for the decision that, that he made because he basically sacrificed her because he wanted his son. And so she died, but for nothing. And that guilt was racking him all this time. So whenever he gets these cuts whenever he gets these this sickness he almost feels as if he deserves it he bears it because he thinks that that's what he's earned and that the ultimately comes up to the final words if you remember from episode eight when he's there on his deathbed and his last words were my love and he's reaching out because for him him dying was him returning to his love, having done his penance. And that's, it's, as I say, it's a fascinating insight into his interpretation of, uh, of that character. So when you're saying that the changes to the character, that was the biggest change to the character. Maybe that was what was there in the book, but they've added to it. Viserys is almost a background character in, in the book. Um, the story is about Damon. The story is about Rhaenyra. The story is about Alicent. He's just this sort of king in the background holding things together, um, but he got elevated by the acting on the show. So is that going to change um, anything in the, the story? Uh, it, well, certainly not in the books, uh, because there are two canons now in George Martin's mind. Martin's um, but will that affect the show? I don't think so. Beyond this point, what might affect things are some of the tangential uh, moments that come out from what he says. So when he's talking about Valyria, when he's talking about dragons, when he's talking about the prophecy, those are the things that were new for the show that are surrounding, swirling around Viserys that will definitely have an impact on the show and um, I was going to say have an impact on the books. I don't think it's, that's the way around it works. I think that some of these things have been in George R. R. Martin's mind for a long time and then he's just sort of like given the go-ahead for them to appear in the show. So we should look out for them in the books. I hope that made sense. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, uh, I think I think that's me caught up on the chat. Um, let's go to um, uh, have a quick look. So, um, Oh, actually, just in the chat, I'm not quite sure what's going on with the watch this cow fly. If that super chat didn't come through, if that was an accident, then it could. if one of the moderators puts the question and just tags me in, that would be great. Let's go to a question from George R. R. Tolkien saying, salutations, Robert. Salutations to you too, sir. Do you think Viserys was so in, uh, interested in old Valyria because of the bond he had with Valerian? We usually see cases where rider and dragon's feelings are connected. Do you think it's possible they can have a mental effect on the rider as well? Okay, so this is um, this is one of the trains of thought that, that I've been going down. I know quite a few other people have been going down. 
is Viserys is the, the, the institutional memory of Valyria on the show in a way that we'd not expected based on his character in the book. He's there. He knows um, where, you know, what the layout of old Valyria was. He, he seems very keen to be passing this information on to people. Um, and he also has this, he, he rode Valerion and he comes out with this line that I said was quite shocking for a Targaryen to come out with, <coughs> for me, quite shocking for a Targaryen to come out with, which was like, we should never have really messed with this. Now, uh, what does this say about his link with Beleriand? Well, potentially, as you've hinted, there's there's this two-way thing going on. We always think about the bond between the rider and the dragon. The rider can kind of like influence the dragon to go off and do certain things, and um, uh, you can't control a dragon, but the bond is there. And we always think about it as going one way. But the question is, particularly when you have a dragon as old and strong and knowledgeable as Valerian, could it go the other way? Particularly if Valerian, as, as just sort of a, a random thought that some people come out, in his old age, started to go, as, as many older humans do, start to spend more of their time in their minds back in their childhood. That is some of the thinking about why he went back to old Valeria with Aria. Could that thoughts, those thoughts of old Valeria be going into Viserys? Could that be what is about his obsession with it? Now, possibly, <laughs> we don't have the information. What it is very clear, to me at least, is that the way on the show they presented it as those two, those two were the Targaryens, those two being him and Daemon. They were the, the Targaryens that we were being shown the inheritance. Daemon gives gifts of Valyrian steel. He talks more than anyone else in old Valyrian. He's the one that goes singing to Vermithor. When he gets married to Rhaenyra, they do this in an old Valyrian ceremony. He is being a representative of old Valyria in the culture. Viserys was being a representative of old Valyria in the history, in the, the knowledge and the understanding. He's the one who is the keeper of the prophecy. He's the one who's the, uh, the keeper of the knowledge about old Valyria. He's the one who, uh, who knows so much about the histories. So those two were being held up as the bearers of Targaryen-ness, of Val Valyrian-ness. Um, now, uh, is if that's the case, that slightly lessens, I suspect, the argument that this is coming uh, from Beleriand. But that doesn't mean it's not there. We we don't know enough about the bond between Rider and Dragon. My take on um, what we're supposed to uh, assume about Viserys and Beleriand is that he rode Beleriand, but he lost control in riding Beleriand. We've seen this now several times. This isn't just like a, a random, oh, maybe he lost control. It's We saw it with Aemond flying Vega, uh, and and also uh, Viserys, obviously, as well two dragon riders losing control of their dragons. We have Aria Targaryen losing control of, of uh, Beleriand. It's not, particularly as he would have been young at the time and Beleriand would have been very old, it's, it's actually quite likely that he found uh, for at least a few moments that he could not control Beleriand, this ancient, massive, ferocious dragon. And so that thought will have stayed with him. And when Beleriand dies, does he want to ride another dragon? No, because he's seen quite how powerful and fierce Beleriand is and the fact that he cannot uh, uh, control him all the time. That leads him to be saying, we cannot control the dragons. Uh, that leads him to be saying, we should 
probably not have messed with this at all. It reminds me, if you'll forgive the rather random analogy, it reminds me of a story I, uh, I heard about Stanley Kubrick, the great director, who um, way back in time, he, um, uh, he was a pilot, just a hobby of his. He was a pilot. Um, and he happened to be shooting something in the south of England. He was flying the plane um, and he lost control of the plane while he was flying just for five, ten seconds. He regained control, landed safely. And he vowed from that moment on he was never getting in an aeroplane again because he knew if he lost control of the aeroplane, anybody could lose control of an aeroplane, or at least that's where his mind went. And so he stayed in England. Stanley Kubrick just said, right, as of now, I happen to be in this country, I'm never going on a plane again, therefore I'm going to set up home in this country, which is why all of the later Stanley Kubrick films are all films in England, because that's where he was. And that's the kind of feel I think I, I get from Viserys, is that he was flying Valerian, he lost control, and they thought, if I lose control, anyone could lose control, I'm not doing that again. That doesn't mean that he's going to tell other people you shouldn't do it, but you know, if asked, he probably would admit, I don't think we should be flying these dragons. Um, let's uh, so auspicious see. Uh, oh, wow, that's a very generous uh, super uh, super sticker. Thank you so much. Uh, saying you're amazing. Thank you. That's very kind indeed. Um, uh, Tejo Woods saying Viserys was happier with his model dragons than his Warhammer Old Valyria model set. I think he would have been happier playing with his fake dragon than the real ones here. Absolutely. Um, uh, Andrew Kay saying, to me, given Valerian was on death's door and could barely ride, I wonder if uh, Viserys chose that bond or rider to just check it off the list and be done with it. I, I mean, that's possible. That's another way of interpreting it. We've got so little information on this that I think what, whatever assumptions we take into it kind of do kind of guide what what we take out from it. Um, uh, I, I'm very aware of my my assumptions going into it of why I think that that is what happened. But yeah, that's another completely legitimate interpretation is the fact that he from the beginning he didn't want to be riding a dragon, and so he chose a dragon that he could just fly once or twice, say that's done, and never have to deal with it again. I mean, I that's quite a high risk strategy for somebody just in case they have to ride a dragon at some point later. Um, and I mean, I don't know. I, if, if I were, if I were not wanting to ride a dragon personally, uh, I would say, no, I want to have a new dragon um, and then get a dragon egg and allow that dragon to, to grow up. And that postpones the moment where you need to ride a dragon. But uh, yeah, maybe you just think, Balearian will die soon. Um, let's have a quick through. Uh, Voltaire the Goldflame saying, Viserys knows dragons aren't truly controllable. Would be annoying if every time a dragon was used in Fire and Blood for something cruel was shown it was an accident, like in episode 10. Uh, yes, uh, this was well, so the. This is one of those big themes, I think, which has come out from House of the Dragon, which has been introduced. The, the prophecy was obviously one. I'll talk about that actually a little bit later. But the the you cannot control a dragon thing was one of the big themes. So we'd already had this idea of area losing control of a dragon in Fire and Blood, but uh, we'd not really seen dragon riding in A Song of Ice and Fire. We just had Danny climbing on the back of Drogon and then not being able to control a dragon. Uh, so that that was pretty much it. The, the assumption was, given all of these wonderful uh, Targaryens in the past who all rode their dragons, Danny was there thinking, how on earth did they manage to do this? There must be something I'm getting wrong. Um, but so this this theme of not being able to control your dragon, it certainly came up then episode 10, this was something they started to try and build up to um, I if I had a, a minor critique of House of the Dragon, it's taking a bit of the volition away from some characters by having accidents, by having uh, things happen 
uh, by coincidence, uh, by misinterpretation. Um, I think some of that is great, but uh, I wouldn't want that to be the main driving force of the Dance of the Dragons. So yes, I thought it worked really well when we had uh, the the incident in episode 10 where two people lose control of the dragons. I think it would work really well if we get another moment later when that also happens. We have got, let's not forget, a whole load of young dragon riders and a whole load of new dragon riders um, coming on board in season two with the dragon seeds. So it seems likely. I wouldn't want it to happen all the time. Uh, that would, for me, that would be pushing it a little bit too far. Let's go to a question from Reflective Rambling. Oh, this is the Watch This Cow Fly. Um, wondering about the connections to Howl's Moving Castle. In particular, I'm drawn to the idea that, like Howl, maybe Howl and Reed has a connection to a fire demon. Please see below. Um, uh, if he saved a Targaryen, may I suggest Ashara's parents were Targaryen? Could answer how Ned got home quickly. Um, Howl's moving castle has portals. Maybe Howland does someone looking older than they are. Old man, question mark. Okay, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot there. I mean, Howl's moving castle, I'm not an expert on, I will have to say. Um, could there be a, a connection between Howl's moving castle and Howl and Reed? I don't know on the timings of that. George R. Martin does like to um, uh, get inspiration from a variety of places. For those who don't know, um, the uh, Greywater Watch, the House Reed Castle, moves around. It's it's on sort of a floating island in the swamp, basically. Now, yes, I agree completely. There are echoes there in terms of N Ned getting back home quickly. I I personally don't find that a mystery. Um, if you go back, I mean, I did videos on all of this ages ago um and so i was looking in more detail than it's probably good for my sanity at all of the different timelines uh but there's no there's no real suspicion there as far as i'm concerned um you you can get a boat most of the way is the short answer and um ned if uh if he is there with the um, the Danes, House Dane, he can get a boat direct from there all the way around to King's Landing. He can then get a boat from King's Landing all the way up to um, uh, White Harbour, and then it's quite a short journey up the White Knife River. So him moving quickly is not that's not a problem for me. But I, I like the uh, I like the thinking. Um, not sure. Uh, that oh, the Ashara's parents. The last point on this one, uh, before we bring it back to uh, by Ceres, in terms of um, uh, Ashara Dane's parents. Now, the George R. R. Martin has been clear, so House Dane has got uh, different looks to a lot of other houses, particularly they've got purple eyes, which um. And dark hair, uh, which has led some people to wonder whether or not they might have some Targaryen link. George R. Martin has basically said, no, sometimes you just have different uh, families or groups. They've got shared features. Um, there are some, feel free to go and uh, explore, there are some people who have speculated that House Dane may have originally come from the far east of Essos in a way that the Valyrians originally came from the far east of Essos. Um, I think there's a lot of sense in that, uh, but uh, that's not, uh, I think that's a bit too much for this, uh, this live stream. Um, let's go to uh, Pierre Davis. Are we aware of any edicts from Viserys I that still hold up currently? Um, edicts. I can't think of any off the top of my head. I mean, I'm happy if anyone in the chat can think of any, um, then please do uh, put them in the chat and I'll happily read them out. Um, we read a lot about what his predecessor, Jaehaerys, did with Septon Bath. They, um, and also 
with Allison, they created a huge amount of codified law, and that was the, one of the big things that they did during their reign. So the impression we get with Viserys is that he inherited a great situation and then just uh, enjoyed it. <laughs> uh, he, he had feasts, he had jousts, he rewarded people lavishly. Um, it wasn't for him... It wasn't about the creating new laws and edicts. That wasn't really what he was about. Uh, let's go to Euro Aussie American Pride uh, saying In House of the Dragon, the Valarians are supposed to be beautiful. The show messed it up by casting black actors. I don't like this erasure of our people in media. Um, I will humbly disagree with you on that one. I think that they were beautiful. Um, uh, watch this cowfly saying thank you, love your work. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the uh, Alhad saying hi, Robert. In the show, Viserys hints at foul play in the death of his father Balon. In the books, Balon dies from a burst belly, which started as a stitch in his stomach during hunting. This sounds suspicious. What is your take on this? Uh, there is one difference, though, if I remember correctly. In uh, the book, Otto Hightower is an old town when Balon dies. I think that was not the case in the show. Okay, so um, uh, the way that he um, uh, says it on the show, he doesn't say it like that in the book. We don't have a record of that in the book. Uh, for those who don't remember, it was a sort of a throwaway line, but basically with, with Otto Hightower... He sort of said, you've always been plotting against me. Hey, you and the Maesters, what was going on with my dad? You were probably involved in that as well. Otto does not deny it, <laughs> um, which is kind of suspicious. Um, but they didn't talk about it in detail in on the show. In the book, it's very clear um, that he went on a hunting trip. He got a stitch, stomach ache. He got taken back to King's Landing. He was dead within a week. Um, the the new maester at the time, Ronsator, tried a few things, but all he could do it was give him a bit of milk of the poppy and ease the pain. Um, and so the um, uh, the question is, was he murdered? That there's no real hint that he was. I think is the honest answer. He, he Occam's razor suggests probably it's just a burst appendix. Probably that's what it was. Um, sometimes these happen, these things happen. So, um, could he have been murdered? Possibly again, if this is the maesters, if you wish to be looking for, for where the maesters could have done this, um, maybe they could have murdered him. Why would they want to murder him? Well, to hurry it along, his son taking over, possibly. Um, for me, that pushes it a little bit, just a little bit too far. Um, for the conspiracy, I mean, I'm all in favor of a big maester conspiracy, but for me, that's probably, um, uh, pushing a bit too far. Carlos Ballerina saying the only edict I'm uh, aware of is not talking about the strong rumours. Yeah, he definitely did that. Um, uh, Luna Cascade saying, what was the true relationship between uh, Corliss and Viserys? Respect, mutual wariness, etc. Um, let's, well, so I think there was there was family relationship and some respect, but Corliss did seem to be very um, uh, ambitious, let's put it that way. And also, although it didn't really come across very strongly on the show, also uh, there was a huge age difference. Corliss Velaryon was uh, at the start of the Dance of the Dragons, uh, forgive me for not remember the exact age, but in his 70s. He was just clinging on to life. He was there giving speeches about how maybe the gods have saved me for this one last moment. Um, 
he was a living legend. He was the man who traveled further than anyone else in all of Westerosi history. He was the man who had explored as far as uh, a shy and brought back things, wonders that no one had ever seen before. He was the richest person in the whole realm. He married um, the queen who never was. His, uh, his children were dragon riders. He was the most influential, the most charismatic figure imaginable then we get Viserys who happens to be king but he's also a people pleaser he's also just amiable he doesn't seem very strong I think that the dynamic between the two of them if you put them in the same room you could kind of understand it Corlys Velaryon heading off, okay, I need to deal with the Stepstone situation, I'm going to go off there and, and, and sort that out, and I will deal with it myself. Uh, Viserys sits at home, go, okay, other people are doing with that, that's fine. They seem to have very different characters. So, um, was there um, sort of respect, mutual wariness? I mean, I think some, but I think it's simply they were just very different people. And um, Corlys Velaryon, in particular, seemed to think that he'd been snubbed lots of times by Viserys, by the world. Um, first of all, Rhaenys should have been queen, then Laenor should have been king, then uh, Viserys, if he was going to remarry, then he should have married Lena. That would have brought his family back into the line of succession. Um, thought he'd been snubbed three times. He was um, really quite angry. So, uh, yeah, I don't think it was an easy relationship, but he never, uh, he didn't seem to let it spill over all that much. Um, let's, uh, yeah, lots of lo uh, love to the mods, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, as I say, I... I'm very clear, uh, clear that we should keep this place uh, a safe space for everybody. So thank you very much for dealing with that issue earlier. Um, uh, question from Alison saying, um, uh, so glad some finances freed up so I could become a patron, uh, which gives me opportunity, first of all, to say welcome to Patreon, but also patrons, thank you. I hugely appreciate your support. Um, I can't do what I do without your support. That is why I frame all of these live streams around um, my uh, questions that I get from my patrons. Um, there is a link to my Patreon down there somewhere if you would like to uh, support this channel. That's the best way to do that. Um, uh, and you kindly said I could call you Alison as, as your last name is, is difficult. I will happily call you Alison. Thank you. Um, what does it say about Viserys that he was able to claim Valerian? Why do you think Viserys never took another dragon after Valerian died? So I've, I've answered some of this, but the, the first bit about what it says about him that, um, that he could claim Valerian in the first place. Well, we have the, the one example of area who um, seems to have been able to claim Balerion, but not control him. So I think that the, the answer is lying in this mystery of whether Viserys actually controlled him. It, if he claimed him and he... Uh, flew around a few times, then Valerian got a bit tired and this just flew back down and Viserys got off and thought, I was in control of none of that. Um, I'm not going to get on again. That's a very different thing to him getting on, flying Valerian a few times, but then suddenly realizing Valerian actually just wants to have a nap in the afternoon nowadays because he's a very old and tired dragon. Um, the, the thing which is more telling for me than even that, though, is the fact that he chose him. He chose Valerian. Um, Valerian was the biggest, the fiercest, the oldest dragon. Valerian was the dragon of kings. And also Valerian was the dragon who the last time somebody tried to claim Valerian, they went off, uh, uh, got flown off to old Valeria and horrific things happened. This was not the easy choice. 
this was not the choice of somebody who was uh, very like the uh, the viceros we see in the book this isn't the person who likes an easy life what was it if if i again this this comes into my general theory on viceros we we, we will never know this probably because we're not going to actually, actually get this bit of information but what if he did start out being this big and bold uh, young man who claims the biggest, most fearsome dragon possible? Uh, that requires some ego, that requires some strength of purpose. What if he gets the shock of his life riding Valerian? And that is what turns him into this, actually, you know what? I'm going to do the easy life from now on. That that just works for me. Um, so yeah, if if I had to guess, that's the most important thing we, we've got going on there. Why did he never take another dragon? I think I think it was he just didn't. Maybe it's a you just don't take another dragon. You've had that bond and it doesn't work with anyone else ever again. Maybe it is that, but from what he said on the show, he just thinks. He couldn't control a dragon. He doesn't think we should be riding dragons. He's definitely not going to be doing it again. Um, Luna Cascades, how do you think that Viserys felt about his small council? Um, oh, interesting. So... Uh, I think he found them... A lot of the time to be quite um, a hassle, but he he seems to have appointed people. He seems to have used it sometimes to try and um, make life easy um, uh, as a as a way of getting politically through something. But sometimes he, a lot of the time, it's just an extension of how he seemed to operate. He just he went with the easy option, so. We're not told all of the details of all of the different members of his council at every different moment in time, but he definitely had Damon on the council a couple of times before it became very clear this would not work with him and Otto on the same uh, council, so he then gave him the head of the City Watch role, head of the Gold Cloaks. But although we look at characters like Otto Hightower as being... Um, all about power and advancement and plotting behind the scenes and that was there it's also very clear that he was competent he was capable he was a good hand of the king taken in abstract he ruled the empire well it we we can say which is true the viserys inherited an easy time the jaharis left a content kingdom that was being that was prosperous but he also seems to have um, been quite um, generous. He seems to have thrown a lot of big parties. He seems to have given a lot of gifts to people. And yet somehow that has not bankrupted them in any way, shape or form. There was still a lot of money left over by the time Viserys died. Compare that to Robert Baratheon, for example, who equally seems to have, like, enjoyed spending money but at the end of it his time the the seven kingdoms was bankrupt so viserys seems to have chosen people to be on his small council who actually did the boring work um now that's lord merryweather was there we also get um uh lord strong as hand of the king seems to have been competent and good um he seems to have had around him people who would do the job which is fine because he seemed to be not that interested in doing the job so his relationship with the small council yes it was sometimes a hassle for him but most of the time i think he just let it get on and do do what they wanted to do uh interesting question um Uh, Andrew Kay saying he seemed to be a good delegator. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Pierre Davis, what king would have been most capable on the wall? I, I suppose it depends what you mean by capable. Um, Magor would have been 
probably the strongest fighter out of all of them. Um, Aegon would certainly have been indomitable up there. Um, so you, there's a lot of kings that you would probably have at the wall, but it, are you wanting somebody to be doing the fighting or are you wanting somebody to be doing the organizing of it? Um, someone like Jaehaerys, or even Viserys the second, who we will come on to in a few weeks' time, they were very good at running things. So, um, yeah, I think it depends on what, what you're wanting. But uh, as an all-rounder, I would probably go with uh, Aegon the first. Uh, Martin S. saying, good evening, Robert. I hope you had a nice time with friends. I did. Thank you very much. What was the age of King Viserys when he started to go decrepit? Any idea when your next live stream about the Tolkien verse will be? Uh, okay, so in terms of uh, the, the Tolkien live stream, I think I've put it in for two weeks' time. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's when the, the next one is. So next week we will, in fact, it'll be three weeks' time. Next week we're going to look at um, Rhaenyra who did rule she was ruler she was expunged from the list of rulers but she ruled for six months and then we're going to look at Aegon the second and then after that we'll go and do another character from the top universe so i've been going through the fellowship that i did frodo i did um pippin i think uh maybe we'll do mary next time um we'll, we'll just work our way through that I, I really enjoyed doing that so far it's been uh, really good fun um just while I think about it, uh, just uh, in terms of live stream timings, um, I've sort of teased this a few times. I have a new channel, IDG Live. I am uploading all of my live streams onto that channel. That channel is also where I'm putting my shorts, my short videos. I'm now trying to create a couple of short videos uh, every week. So if you're into that, they will be over there. They're also going onto Instagram uh, I'll be on TikTok soon as well. So uh, if you're interested in that, um, from, and I will announce this properly at some point, but from, I think, May, all of the live streams will be happening over there on that other channel. So keep an eye out for that. I will let you know before that happens. So do not worry for the time being. We're still staying on the main in Deep Geek channel, uh, but I'm trying to move, gradually move all of my live content over onto that channel. At the age of King Viserys, when he started to go decrepit, I think it depends on what you call decrepit. So um, when he uh, took the throne, he was 26, and he reigned for about another uh, quarter of a century after that. So um, I, I think the we have in our mind this picture we've got of him from the show it, it feels slightly different in the book in the book it feels very much that he was just um uh he over over eight um under exercised didn't really look after himself and he just um died an early death because of that that's the feel that we've got going on uh, yes there were some infections and a few other things um so de i don't think decrepit is quite the word i would use but in, in terms of when did he start going downhill relatively early would be the uh, the answer certainly his 40s probably even his 30s um i i get the impression probably after emma died um he did it wasn't as big a thing in the book, this this lost love, but it definitely was there. This idea, he never, he thought he didn't want to marry again. Uh, he he had the love of his life. He lost the love of his life. I, I think that was the point uh, where he, uh, it, it all started going downhill. So yeah, uh, probably in his 30s. Um. Have a quick flip through. Uh, oh, Dagon Trous, will you make a live stream sharing any new thoughts on A Clash of Kings, just like you did with the Game of Thrones? Yes, I will, actually. Uh, thank you for reminding me. So I am very slowly um, re-listening my way through A Song of Ice and Fire. I, I listen to quite a few different things at any given moment of time. Uh, but I've, uh, I've been slowly working my way through A Clash of Kings. I'm... Um, the risk of sort of sending all George, Mar George R. R. Martin about it. I think I'm about 75% of the way through at the moment. Um, so yeah, at some point, then I will do another one uh, looking at that. I, I've the, the There's been a lot of just um, 
reevaluating a lot of things going through this. Um, uh, the gaining a new respect, respect for Courtney Penrose that I hadn't had before. Uh, what else struck me? Um, a few throwaway lines that taken out of context, you go, oh, wow, well, that's an interesting thing. Um, like Brienne um, just sort of musing to herself, well, if you had to think who the real king is, it's probably still the Targaryens. Everybody here is, uh, it shouldn't be a king. Um, so is she secretly sympathetic to the Targaryen cause? Will she when she uh, when Daenerys comes across? We'll have to wait and see on that one. But it was interesting that she started talking about that quite early on. Um, and um, yeah, there's, so there's been a lot. Uh, but uh, I what I did, I think I did one with Aziz last time when I finished book one. When I finished book two, uh, maybe with Aziz, maybe with someone else, uh, I will do another live stream just setting out thoughts on book two as a whole. Um, I have I have in my mind that I, uh, the, when I finish my slow read through, that's when the winds of winter will magically appear. It won't happen like that, but uh, I, I love the idea that I will I will finish my listen through, at which point I can then start listening to the next book. That would be uh, fantastic. Um, uh, Castle Tours with Robert is a new show that needs to happen. I, I would happily do Castle Tours. I, I do love, um, uh, I do love a castle. Um, let's go to Emma S saying, hi, Robert, been loving this series so far. When Prince Balon died, did Viserys and Damon's relationship change in any way? Well, we're, we're not told, uh, huge amounts about what their relationship was like before. What we are told, however, is in the background of the, um, the council, which happened just off of the back of, uh, obviously, Balon died, Viserys accedes to, um, or Viserys is up there as being like the one of the possibles. And we're told that Damon at that time started gathering an army um, because he just thought Corlys Velaryon is clearly going around trying to get the throne for his son. I'm going to stop him. There, there would have been civil war at after the count the Great Council if Viserys had lost. Damon would have started a civil war. Now, if you're also looking for another reason why the Maesters might have decided that they wanted to go with Viserys, that's another one because that did prevent a civil war. Certainly, I think that in the telling people this was a an overwhelming victory, over 95% in support, that I think certainly smacks of somebody trying to dampen down the idea that um, Corliss should rise up in uh, in opposition, because we read in Fire and Blood that Corliss was really angry and thought this was or he was robbed, his family was robbed again. However, when he realised that over 95% of people had voted against his side, then he kind of grumbled a lot and went away. So that, just letting it be known that it was a, a landslide in, in favour of Viserys certainly seems to have been something the Maesters did try, try and prevent civil war. But had Corliss won, yes, Damon would have gone to talk about the relationship between them. Well, that they were... And for him, obviously, he thought he was the heir after Viserys. So I, I, we, we don't know for sure. But the implication is that this was a strong relationship between the two of them. They, they were very different people, but it was a good and positive one. They built up that relationship a lot more on the TV show. The... Um, I always want to call him Matt Damon, Matt Smith, who played Damon. Matt Smith has, he's said uh, quite a few really interesting things about his process for playing that character. And he says that he sat down with the showrunners and they were trying to work out what his motivations were. And 
he basically said it was love for his family, that specifically Viserys and Rhaenyra, that was what was driving him. And that more than a lust for power. And that is not how it comes across in the book. Now, these are two different characters, uh, two different canons, obviously, uh, but uh, it, it, in the show, it seems very clear that Damon loves his brother above pretty much anything else in the world. Um, question from... Uh, watch this cow fly saying another off topic question. I know. Uh, sorry. Okay. No, no problem. Do you think blood ravens melding with the weirwood throne is the beginning of becoming a weirwood? Is he king of the children? Do specific weirwoods have more significance? Um, well, a lot of questions there. Is he the king of the children of the forest? No, I don't think that's the way that this works. I think that he is a green seer. Um, and that is why he basically got called to the green, uh, the the weirwood network, getting hooked up to it. Does he become a weirwood? No, but he gets. Um, uh, so he he stays there within the root system, and oh, it's just nature takes its course. Um, sl very slowly, he he just sort of like melds into it. He doesn't become. The one doesn't grow out of him. And are some weirwoods more important than others? The prevailing theory on weirwoods is that this is a network, a network of, of weirwoods that goes all the way across Westeros. They have to be linked up to each other underground. And this is why you don't get weirwoods across the other side of uh, large seas or big mountain ranges. Um, why they struggled to get a weirwood to grow at the at the Eyrie, right at the top, for example, because there was all of that stone in between and the roots could not connect up. Um, so it's not a matter of there being one weirwood here and another weirwood there. They're all one organism, which adds a whole extra layer with this kind of, so what's this underground network all about? Um, that's a whole different live stream, though, because um, uh, th there's a lot that you can dig into uh, there, uh, literally as well as figuratively. Uh, Luna Cascade, uh, channel member for two months. Yeah, when you're a channel member here and everywhere, um, you get certain benefits, one of which is free, uh, effectively free Super Jack questions. So why do you think Viserys never bonded with his children with Alicent. It could have changed so much before the dance. Yeah, it could have done. So he does, I mean, this is a um, one of those things I think that we sometimes emphasize too much. He did not bond with them. He did seem to bond uh, certainly with his grandchildren. He, um, seemed to spend time on a daily basis with Helena's children, um, which seems to imply he got on with Helena. Uh, maybe he just, maybe it was just, he didn't like Aegon, which is understandable, or Aemond. Um, he, Deiron, he sent off um, uh, basically to be fostered down in Old Town. Uh, so why didn't he bond with them? I mean, it's it's quite hard to say because we're not given the the information. But he did; he certainly did with some. I think he had a soft spot for Helena. He definitely enjoyed spending time with her children, um, which is obviously also Aegon's children. So there was like a he liked being the granddad, um, but maybe he just didn't like uh, Aegon and Aemond. And and I think that's I think that's fair. <laughs> um, there there is a. There is an element that he will, he wasn't stupid. Yes, he was a conflict avoider, but he also wasn't stupid. And I think he will have realized that him choosing Rhaenyra meant, had a huge impacts on Aegon um, and Aemond as well. Uh, Voltaire the Gold Flame saying, I bet skin changing and dragon bonding are related. And perhaps this is part of why Viserys longs to be a dragon dreamer. 
Um, yeah, interesting point. So um, the, I, I mean, people have speculated on the links between skin changing and dragon bonding for quite some time. My personal view is that they are different. They, they can be connected. I think all of the magic in the world of a song of ice and fire is connected in some way, but I think that they come from different sources. Um, I fully subscribed to subscribe to the idea that uh, Viserys, um, sorry, that the dragon bonding comes from the fact that the uh, the Valyrians, the Targaryens, had some gene splicing with dragons thousands of years ago. Um, so they literally are part dragon. Whereas the skin changing does seem to be connected more across towards the old gods and the um, uh, the weirwoods. So that's much more to do with Westeros as a place. So it's it's more a sort of one's a Westeros thing, one's more of an Essos kind of thing. Um, Carl Karsnark saying uh, Matt uh, Damon Smith has been getting early scripts for season two and some scout location scouting has begun. Yeah, we're actually we're even further on from that. So he has said, he said recently, he has now got scripts for season two. He said they were quite late. Um, as I understand it, just in terms of a filming update, they had planned to start filming in Spain, actually, um, in this month. That, uh, as I understand it, got pushed back a bit um, for a variety of reasons. Perhaps the scripts weren't finished if they were arriving a little bit late uh, for Matt Smith. Um, that ran into a whole load of uh, issues with uh, whether the where they wanted to be doing the filming would be available just a couple of weeks later, running into Easter and places and times like that. So... Uh, as I understand it, next month filming will be starting. So um, we, we're still on track, I think, for the second half of next year for season two. Uh, I think we're very close to to filming it, itself starting. Um, let's have a... Uh, <laughs> Rector family saying, is it time for another trip back to Spain? Um uh, th then down to African coast to spy on other film. Well, I'd, I'd love to spend my time um, uh, visiting lots of uh, film sets. I, th I think the, uh, there will also obviously be quite a lot of filming going on in England, uh, which um, we didn't really find out about until they started filming. Right? So the ones in Spain, we know where they're going to be filming, but uh, maybe some of the some of the England uh, filming, it will come with a bit more of a surprise. Um, Martin S, is anything known, known about how the magic making the Night King works, apart from what the Game of Thrones show showed? Um, no. So it's worth noting that the <clears throat> there's a difference between the Night King, which is a show thing, and the Night's King, which is a book thing. They are different and separate. Um, if we're taking show canon without thinking about the books, then... Um, this was clearly uh, a bit of magic done by the children of the forest in order to create some super creatures who would be able to fight against humans, the first men. Um, how that magic was done um, was with dragon glass into the heart in front of a weirwood tree, a sacrifice. Um, uh, and how it was undone was dragon, dragon glass in, into the heart in front of a weirwood tree. Now, they didn't show us any more than that. I don't think they really explained any more than that. I don't think they had aspirations to explain more than that. Um, the, the takeaway point I have from that uh, is that probably what they were trying to show was that the threat from the others is not defeated simply by force of arms, but by undoing the magic that brought them into being in some way. That seems quite like a George R. R. Martin thing. It won't happen in the same way. The Night King does not exist in the same way in George R. R. Martin's universe. Um, that's not to say that there won't be an original other who was created in some way, and that magic needs to be undone, but they're a very different thing. The Night's King in... The books is this 
a legendary figure, the 13th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, who um, went bad, basically. So, um, uh, yeah, they're, they're very different characters. Um, question... Uh, reflective rambling saying new code word. I'm off to see some castles, uh, and and uh, with you, uh, plausible deniability. Well, I'm, I'm often off to see some castles, uh, it's just a matter if they're filming there. Um, is there Ahmed saying if Viserys the first, Lenor, and Varenice all got killed before 101, who would be on the Iron Throne, in your opinion? Oh, wow. So that doesn't leave uh, many. I mean, I think Damon would have claimed it. I think that um, he he was next in line, really. So it would basically be Damon and Lena. So he would have claimed it and married her, and that's where we'd have gone. Now, um, book spoilers, uh, but uh, it's probably time to point out the... Uh, the fact that actually, if you think about who survived, yes, there was this massive family tree, but it was Damon's kids who survived. Uh, two children he had with Lena, two children he had with um, uh, Rhaenyra. That's that was who what was left of the Targaryen family tree. So um, the the if Viserys, Lenor, and Rhaenys all died before 101, the outcome would be exactly the same. It's just that they wouldn't have had a, a, a massive civil war and there would be a lot more dragons. Um, Tejo Wood saying, I recently graduated from my prop, oh, prop making degree here in the UK and would love to join the set of House of the Dragon. It would be an absolute dream and a career goal. Yeah, well, good luck with that. Um, uh, yeah, you, you didn't come here for career advice, but I highly recommend you just shoot your shot uh what could go wrong ask them uh send them send them an email send them send them your cv um i'm sure they have a great need for that um uh, andrew k saying uh paddy considine's portrayal was fantastic only wish they showed a bit more of his positives generous amiable well liked and respected by just about everyone yeah that definitely there was um uh he did a great job to add layers of nuance but that doesn't uh, th if something was missed out from it, I would definitely agree, is that Book Viserys comes across as a fun guy to be around, um, whereas show Viserys is a bit of a downer, let's face it. Um, so that should, that period should have been a period, they showed it like the opening episode with, um, in fact, the opening few episodes, I guess, uh, where you had tourneys and hunts and things, but that was the order of business for most of Viserys' reign. Um, lavishing gifts on people, having uh, big parties. He, he would have been a fun king. Um, question from Kristen H saying, hi, Robert, how much of Viserys' determination to make Rhaenyra his heir stemmed from his affection for Emma? And how does his love for Emma compare to his love for Alicent? Well, I mean, these are obviously connected questions. Uh, how does his love for Emma compare to his love for Alicent? It seems very clear that Emma, although it may well have been a political match, um, was love. Uh, this, it kind of felt to me as a bit like the the Ned Catlin thing is that they may not have initially chosen each other but it just worked they 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 did love each other hugely um with Alicent it was a political match and there's no real way where he he was much older than her uh, she was she was 18 uh, in the books when she married uh, Viserys so he was a couple of decades older um this is um this is a thing that he had to do, and they seem to have got on, but this wasn't love. So how did that affect um, his uh, determination to make and keep Rhaenyra his heir? Well, to make her his heir was um, a reaction to what happened with Damon. The interesting thing for me is why did he decide to 
keep her his heir, his heir. And this does seem to be a part of his character that we don't see much of. He comes across as we as I say, we use these same words, amiable, uh, um, conflict avoiding, but also he seems to have had an inner determination to him. Once he's made a decision, that's it. He's done. Um, he's, there's no backing down on it now. Um, he made his decision that Rhaenyra was his heir. He didn't feel the need to always say it, but it was always very clear she was his heir. Was that because he saw a bit of Emma in her? Quite possibly. I I, I, I do like the idea. It's It's... It's maybe it's the old romantic in me. I don't know, but this the the way they captured it on the show that this was Viserys's the love of his life has gone. Um, you could easily imagine how that could transfer into what is the only thing I have left of her. It's Rhaenyra, and so uh, yeah, I, I, it works for me as a as a motivation there um, because the other option is just um sheer determination i'm just i've decided this i'm not going to back down now a feeling that he shouldn't um upset rainera perhaps it, th these things are all possible uh, the the most likely solution is that this was a million different things all interwoven in together together the fact that yes she reminded him perhaps a little bit of uh, her mother, perhaps his conflict avoidance meant that he didn't want to um, uh, take it away from her. Perhaps he thought actively that she would be better than Aegon. Um, there are lots of things playing in there. Though he did at one point, interestingly, threaten to take it away from her. He told her that she had to marry Lenor, and she said no. <laughs> he's gay um and he said well if you don't marry him then i'm gonna disinherit you and eventually she said yes that was very different to how it went out went down obviously in the show but he was very clear he said you will marry him and if you do not marry him you are no longer my heir so uh i don't think it's just this conflict avoiding thing uh, there was another layer in there Um, watch this carefully asking for Otto Hightower. Um, okay, I assume this is this question here. Otto Hightower, um, thank you very much, by the way. Picking up a question for someone else is very kind. Do you find it interesting that both sides blame different things that Viserys did for the dance? Disinheriting Aegon, second marriage, ignoring the bastard problem. Um, yeah, I mean, I find it interesting they, they blame different things, but I think this is just the how this works as much as anything else. Um, th this wasn't a, a matter of let's try and work out what is the, much as either side might have tried to claim it was, let's find out who is the rightful heir, which both of them claimed their person was the rightful heir. This was a matter of what reason can we find for the other person not to be uh, taking over that was that was where they were coming from and so they both found different reasons to be pushing um this the strong thing uh you know your your children are bastards actually was quite a weak defense if if, if they were want a, a line of attack if they were wanting to um be uh saying delegitimizing her that's just delegitimizing her children, not her herself. So um, that was a bit weak. But yeah, I, it doesn't it doesn't surprise me much that they use different arguments. Um, Kelly Summers tangential to a previous answer: If the Danes, oh, so this is talking about the House Dane question. If the Danes are from East Essos, like Valyrians, could they have done the opposite? of Alyssa Farman, hence their ships. Um, oh, what an interesting question. So the, the Danes, this is going back way into history. The Danes followed a shooting star to starfall, basically. 
is that's their origin story. All of these things to do with history in George R. R. Martin's world, when the, you go back thousands of years, he, he repeats all the time, this is legend. We shouldn't take these things literally true. But there seems to be some element of truth to this. They they followed a star to where it landed. Um, it was a meteorite. They used the metal from the meteorite to create a sword. That sword was the sword Dawn, and that is the oldest sword in the world. As far as we, we know, it is legend. This is not like a Valyrian steel sword. This, this is why people often talk about this as being very important to the plot. This is not just a normal Valyrian steel sword that's quite cool. This is a story that was around well before that. This is a, a, a sword that was around well before that. So how might they have followed that star? Could they have gone the other way around the world? Possibly. Um, I think we we wouldn't know. Um, it's a long way in any event. Um, but uh, I mean, I'm going to say yes, possibly. You, you always ask, Kelly, you, you do ask these questions that I'm not sure if I can give a, a definitive answer to all the time. But uh, I, yeah, they could have done. Um, let's go to a question from Mars of Half house bars um hi robert hi there my question is about marriage the show made it seem like the realm was eager for a new queen but there are kings and lords that don't take a second wife for example tywin lannister did viserys really need to marry remarry or was that more of otto and corliss trying to get closer to power um <clears throat> yes the, the short answer is no of course he didn't have to he was the king he could have done whatever he wanted uh so he could have just said no i'm not going to do this um but there was pressure on him to do it from lots of different people corliss was putting pressure on him to marry his daughter the moment and that would have made there, there was a whole load of age icky things we'll put them to one side politically a match there would have made a lot of sense um, it would have pulled the uh, Corliss and the Valerians back in. The, we've already said how he was a bit grumpy. He felt he'd been snubbed several times. Um, this would have brought them back in. Um, the High Towers, however, is not just a random family. The High Towers are one of the top three most powerful families in Westeros at the time. So that also is a good political marriage, which strengthened the realm. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Um, but also, he does seem to have quite liked her. Um, as I say, this doesn't seem to have been a love-love match as with Emma, but he does seem to have quite enjoyed spending time with Alicent. Um, now, the the question is, um, once he'd entertained this idea that he was going to remarry, which he didn't want to to start with, and then he entertained this idea about what if he remarried um, uh, but to Lena Velaryon, I perhaps he went through this brain process of going, okay, so if I want Rhaenyra to become, to be my heir, um, I've got an option here to, to marry Lena, and then maybe at, at some point I will have children with her. If I have a son there, that son's claim is going to be huge. That's going to be an incredibly powerful claim. If he, if his child, if he had a child with Lena Valarion, who was the daughter of the queen who never was, Rhaenys, um, and this was the eldest son, his eldest son, that person's claim would be massive. Rhaenyra would very, very much not have a look in. Uh, so if he accepted the need to remarry, then he might decide he wants to go down a different route. And if he's going to go down a different route, it makes sense for him to marry into one of the most powerful other families uh, so that the Valarians get, don't get too snubbed again. Um, Travis, uh, 
Do you think George R. R. Martin intentionally ripped off Disney's Aladdin when writing this story? A conflict-averse king or sultan who enjoys playing with miniatures, has a manipulative hand or vizier vying for power, and a headstrong daughter with a willful animal-slash-dragon companion who is averse to marriage, trying to be named successor. Drama ensues. Um, obviously, this is a joke, but there are a remarkable number of similarities. Yeah, I hadn't... I have to admit, I'd not spotted that before you said that. But yeah, it, it does work. I don't think it was a deliberate um, uh, thing from uh, uh, George R. Martin, although he does, he, he loves getting inspiration from a wide uh, variety of things. Uh, Selfie the Nutter saying, I disagree with you there. The Alicent Viserys match weakened the realm. It caused the dance which crippled the Targaryens to the point they never acquired, and Corlys was the richest man at that. Yes, it did weaken the realm. It wasn't a matter of how can I strengthen the realm. If he was just wanting to strengthen the realm, marrying Lena Velaryon was the way to go. If he did not marry her, and he decided he did want to marry, then the next best option would have been to marry the next most powerful house. Is That was the, the point. Um... Uh, let's um, uh, and reflect around you say as we, we encourage opinions being challenged yeah I absolutely agree um, uh, Otto Hightower saying why would Viserys' son with Lena have any better claim than uh, than my grandchildren or Otto's grandchildren they would both be the eldest son of the king they would be the eldest son of the king but they would also be Targaryen basically on both sides um and uh, this brings back in the um anyone who was claiming that uh, this should go to uh, the eldest child regardless of gender would then go well okay that was actually that should have been um uh, Rainice the first time around and you could argue that the great council got it wrong um because uh, as we've already pointed out at the beginning of this stream, there is an irony with the fact that um, Viserys was put in power because uh, it should have gone to a woman but went to him instead, and then he decided to name his heir as the woman, not the man. Uh, he was switching it around in the way that he preferred it. So uh, that's the that's the logic. But as with all these things, the king's in charge, and the king can decide. Um, Russler saying, hey, Robert, um, and I think now we're... Oh, no, we've got a couple more questions here. So we've got Russler saying, hey, Robert, do you believe the Targaryen's immunity to illness is a real thing? And if so, do certain illnesses still affect them like the shivers, or is it simply their station as royalty that keeps them sheltered from most illnesses? Yeah, uh, really interesting. So this is definitely something that the Targaryens believe. Danny believes this, that she doesn't, she's not going to get ill because she's a Targaryen. And this is something written into um, when they came out with that doctrine of exceptionalism that uh, Jaehaerys uh, had sort of read out to the realm about to say why the Targaryens were different and didn't have to obey the same rules as everybody else. This was part of it. We don't get sick because we're different and special. Now, we have to look at this on a couple of levels. The first of all, you can say, yeah, most of the time, no, don't. That seems fair. Um, most of the time uh, we get... Uh, Danny doesn't seem to get sick that much, um, and it's fair to say that the average Targaryen doesn't seem to get the same kinds of l diseases that a lot of other people do. So there's an element of truth to this. However, the next level is to say, but they do get sick still. Um, they, they, we've got plenty of examples of Targaryens dying from, as you say, from the shivers um, um, and from various other things. So this isn't a immune thing this is a high level of resistance what seems to happen very broadly speaking if you look at the targaryens who die from something diseasey rather than um in battle or whatever is one or two things either this is something which is affecting absolutely everybody across the realm like the shivers or this is affecting a Targaryen who is always described from the beginning is described as being uh, a sickly child or, or poorly or something like that so either they're somebody who seems to be predisposed in some way to be getting this 
or they're somebody who is um, just gets unlucky because everyone does. But there, there's there's a lot that plays into this. They are the most privileged family in the entirety of Westeros, so they have a better diet. They have um, uh, better living conditions. Uh, they can cut themselves off from uh, people a lot more easily. There's that whole area that that is going there, but. If you start digging into it, then it does seem that there are some things that perhaps they are more immune to than others. It's like it's like the heat resistance. They're not dra dragon. Uh, sorry, Targaryens are not fireproof. They burn like everybody else does, but they do have heat resistance to a certain degree. And it seems that that is what's going on with these um, with diseases, which kind of makes sense if you do go down this line of thought that they have got a little bit of dragon DNA in them. Because if that little bit of dragon DNA gives them a little bit of heat resistance, perhaps it also means that there are some things which affect humans which affect them less, like some sorts of diseases. Um, Chaos Ballerina... Um, this is a six months channel member. Wow. Um, this is a question saying, does never telling Damon about the Song of Ice and Fire mean that Viserys never considered Damon his heir? And does getting cut by the throne mean that Viserys was unworthy? Okay, two questions. Uh, the first one, does him not telling him about the Song of Ice and Fire mean he never considered him his heir? I think the answer to that is yes. And and I think that's why Damon reacted so strongly Um when he discovered this, when he heard this prophecy, um, Viserys on the show, this is. Um, so in the book, it seems reasonably clear that Viserys never considered Damon his heir. He, he never thought that he was his heir. He certainly never announced it to the world that he was his heir. Um, but then it came a point where he realized he had to actually be explicit and say, Rhaenyra is my heir. Um, on the show, they've just added in an extra layer. Viserys doesn't, um, doesn't think that Daemon would be a good king, I think is the short answer. That doesn't mean that he didn't love him. That doesn't mean he didn't care about him. Um, and I suspect he probably deep down hoped that Damon never did find out about that. He just wanted Rhaenyra. He wasn't expecting Rhaenyra to be telling Damon about, about it. Um, so yeah, it's the short answer. He never really wanted Damon to be his heir. Second question uh, being, does getting cut by the throne mean that Viserys was unworthy? I did do a video on this uh, a while ago because it's a fascinating subject. Um, the short answer, I think, is no. I think that this is often used by people politically to sort of justify um, what, you know, this is the throne rejecting this person. If I had to put up a tinfoil theory on this, which I think I put in the video, um, is that this is not, uh, if this is the Iron Throne cutting unworthy people, it's not on the grounds that we might think of as someone being unworthy, being a bad person or something like that. Um, it's on the grounds of them betraying this Song of Ice and Fire and the, the commission that is put on Targaryen kings, rulers, to be keeping the kingdom together and to be um, ensuring that the Targaryens are ruling. Why do I say that? Because when you look at when people get cut, it happens when one of those things is is put in doubt. Aegon the First, we only read of him cutting himself on it once, and that one time is the moment at which he decides to give up on trying to invade Dawn, giving up on the idea of having a united Seven Kingdoms. When uh, did Rhaenyra? get cut on the Iron Throne. It's when she rejected a peace offer from Alicent. It's, it's 
often an overlooked detail of this. Rhaenyra arrives in King's Landing. Alicent is there. Alicent says, okay, uh, why don't we just call this whole thing off? Um, we'll uh, unite our two families, um, two parts of the family, and uh, we can save ourselves a whole load of bloodshed. And Rhaenyra says, no. Then she goes and sits on the throne and she gets cut. And when you look at through all of the different people who we read get cut by the Iron Throne, it's just after they have done something to um, endanger Targaryens being able to meet what they uh, they should be doing, according to the uh, the prophecy. Why might this be the case? Because the Iron Throne was created in a sort of magical way by dragon fire so if that by Aegon the Conqueror whose whose original Song of Ice and Fire this was um, and he apparently said people should never sit easy on the Iron Throne all of which seems to imply that he thought that this was not just a throne it had an extra purpose anyway that's a little bit of tinfoil for you um, Let's go to a question from um, oh, Alison asking why Viserys didn't change the line of succession once Aegon was born, um, and would this have prevented the Dance of the Dragons? Um, I think I think I've answered that one already um, uh, from other people. Uh, I hope you, that's okay, Alison. Um, but you then also asked, how does Viserys compare to King Aenys, uh, the second uh, Targaryen king? Both seem to be people pleasers, but would you say one was a more effective king than the other? Yeah, they do have a, a very similar kind of feel to them. They seem to enjoy the good things in life. They definitely seem to be conflict avoiding. They seem to be people pleasers, as you say. Um, I, I would say that the difference between the two is not so much in the character, it's in the situation they inherited. Viserys could run, rule the Seven Kingdoms as, as a conflict avoider, as a people pleaser, um, as an amiable, happy person, because there were no huge threats at the time when he took over. There were no... Uh, the Faith of the Seven were not uh, rampaging across the country, um, hurling abuse at the Targaryens, calling them... Uh, heretics who all had to die that wasn't something that was going on during his time uh, i suspect he would have found it as hard to um to deal with a uh, high septon who wanted him dead as anise did um anise never had a chance uh, um he he never had an easy time it he, from the very moment that he started out the faith were up in arms against him um and that that meant that his way of ruling did not work if you put any sin to viserys situation i suspect he would have probably led a very similar kind of reign i think he would have done quite well we did Vi viserys seems we talked earlier about how he did seem to delegate well he did seem to choose the right people to be in charge um but uh, maybe Aenys would have shown those skills as well. Okay, I've got one more question to come uh, from my patrons. So uh, now is a good time to uh, drop any more questions into the chat. I'll just quickly flick through. Um, uh, Carl Carson, a really interesting point, saying, Swords from below on the throne are just like the sword of Damocles from above, a great literal inversion of the same idea. Really, I like that thinking. That's good. Um, Azair Ahmed saying, If all of the Targaryens got killed in the dance, who would be king or queen, in your opinion? Um, uh, well, whoever took it. Um, that's, that's a fascinating question. Who would be king or queen? Um, the first question is whether it would stay as a united seven kingdoms, because um, I, th I think if all of the Targaryens and all of the um, people linked into the Targaryens, like House Valarion and all of the dragons went, 
I suspect that House Stark would say, oh, well, in that case, we'll just go back being the kings of winter, kings of the north, um, and they would declare independence and there wouldn't be any dragons around to stop them. Dawn would obviously carry on just doing its Dornish thing. The Iron Islands would have probably just done their thing. Um, and then the question is, do any of the other people uh, wish to stake a claim to the Iron Throne? You would you would be able to find out who conceivably could claim to be next, because there's always someone who's conceivably there. Maybe a, one of the Baratheons would, uh, would suddenly say, you know what? we're closest to the throne, we'll take it. There are lots of possibilities, but the most likely, I think, would be the Seven Kingdoms would just break up. Um, uh, let's... Oh, uh, Rembling saying, I did a cheap super chat saying, happy... Oh, apologies for, for missing that one. Must have just flashed by saying happy belated birthday to Egret Weirwood and Cloaked One. Um, happy birthday, both of you. Uh, you are amazing humans, and I hope you had wonderful name days. Um, and keep blessing us. Uh, so uh, that's uh, apologies for missing that one. I don't let me know uh, if I missed any more. I don't think I missed any more super chats. Um, Mara Lee, uh, <coughs> pardon me saying, I'm interested to see um, how the showrunners will deal with the whole prophecy thing moving forward in season two, especially since we will see one of Rhaenyra's sons visiting Winterfell. I'm curious to hear what the Starks think of this whole thing um, and the threat from the North. Could the North Remembers be a part of that? I could see the whole thing about prophecy being brought up during a meeting with the Starks and the Northern Lords, and either the Starks or one of the Northern Lords saying, yes, that we know something about this prophecy. That's why we have the Night's Watch to guard the realm of men. Why there must always be a Stark in Winterfell, something like that. Well, I'd love to know what people think about this going forward. Um, I Yes, the, the big thing that everybody's thinking about in terms of this prophecy next, well, the two big things. The first one is, who's Rhaenyra going to be telling? Who, out of all of these people, will carry this on beyond the end of the dance? Um, Will it end up? Will Aegon the Third end up knowing about this? Um, that's one thing. The other thing is, what about if when Jace gets to the North, he did not seem to have been told. As far as we we didn't see a scene where he was told by Rhaenyra, "Here, you're my heir. Here's the the things. Here's this." Um, prophecy which needs to be handed down that doesn't mean it didn't happen but one would have thought they would have set that up if they were going to do something big about this i i think they will um they would find it hard not to touch on this in the north um I, there are so many great possible storylines um they've got going on there and having introduced this clear idea of a threat from the north for Viserys, for them not to mention it in the one thing in this whole story when we do get to the north, I think would just, that would seem a little odd. So, yes, but whether Jace knows about it, I don't know. The Starks perhaps might mention something. Um, uh, it's going to be fascinating. Uh, I had assumed, once they introduced this prophecy, that Jace would be told about it, and then he would get to the north and say, this is absolutely vitally important that we stay uh, in power. You have to join us, not just because uh, your father um, swore fealty to Rhaenyra, but also because um, we will support the north. We know that there's a threat from the north. Uh, and then the Starks go, yes, of course there is. So that was how I thought that that would go down. But they don't seem to have been um, uh, teeing it up in the way. Uh, Kelly Summers asking, was Robert uh, ever cut by the, cut the throne? Not you. Uh, this is Robert Baratheon. We don't hear of it. Um, but then he didn't seem to sit on the throne all that much. So, um, yeah, it's not. It seems to be more about Targaryens than, than him. Um, 
Otto Hightower saying, were Viserys and Rhaenyra hypocritical or selfish? Viserys ignores the precedent that gets him to power, whilst Rhaenyra disinherits other female heirs in minor houses during her reign. Um, yes, perhaps. Um, you could certainly argue there is a certain hypocrisy there, uh, particularly for Viserys. Um, uh, Rhaenyra disinheriting other female. I think Rhaenyra was, once we get into the war, she is in pure pragmatic mode. I, I, and I think that, that the idea of points of principle doesn't really um, uh, ring true for her. I think that the only point of principle she cares about is the fact that she should be ruling. Um, Viserys, hypocritical or selfish in uh, ignoring the precedent that got into power? Yes. But also, he's the king. He can do what he wanted. Um, let's have a flick through, uh, see what other questions we've got in the chat. Um, Kolnitsky saying uh, Robert was not ever cut by the throne. Yeah, we certainly don't have any evidence of that. Um, uh, Carl Karsnock saying the Starks and the Targs conversation. I know you know. I know you know. I know. I know you know. You know. I know. Yep, it's going to be something like that. Um, uh, lots of talking about baking, which is excellent. Um, and I think that's probably uh, it. Okay, so let's um, just pause for just one moment, just for uh, I can advertise my second channel, uh, IDG Live. I mentioned it a little bit earlier. This is where all of my live content is migrating over to. If you want short form content, uh, which is just me reacting a lot more, making a lot more pithy points, um, that's the place to go. From May, all of these live streams will be moving over there as well. So the best way to prepare for that, if you want, is to go and subscribe. There will, after the live stream finished, in the middle up here somewhere, will be a link to that. But there's also a link down in the description. I'll be back next week talking about Rhaenyra. Um, and I'm sure we'll have lots of uh, more excellent questions along these lines that we were starting to explore here as well. Uh, appearing somewhere around here, if you're watching back later, is going to be a link to other live streams I have done. Appearing somewhere around here is a link to my Patreon page, which is the best way to support me if you so wish. Patrons, thank you. And moderators, you did an excellent job today again. As always, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to anyone who uh, commented and Super Chats. Uh, it means a lot to me. Thank you so much. Uh, take care, everyone. I will see you again same time next week. Bye now.